Spoiler alert, Troy falls. Hey number one. Before making this video I made a post on Facebook where I expressed my resentment towards two things. First, the representation of the Greek hero Achilles as a black African in the TV series Troy, Fall of a City. And secondly, my resentment towards this disgrace of a BBC cartoon, which I will fully debunk on this, on this video because it does not represent uh, properly Roman Britannia. All of this, of course, sprouted an awful lot of comments, some interesting, some warlike, some completely out of place, and it became a debate on racism. Considering the sensitive nature of this topic, I was then advised not to make this video. As an answer to this advice, I now publicly state, a man should never be afraid of speaking his mind, even if it goes against the public opinion of the masses. Not adhering to social conformities just because they are becoming trendy is, on the contrary, an act of courage. Freedom of speech is a very important right, and our grandparents have fought against people like Hitler so that we could have it. There are, of course, some universally accepted lines that should not be crossed, but definitely both my post and this video do not cross them. If I said I didn't like black Achilles because I don't like black people, that would be racist. But just saying I don't like black Achilles is my right, and it does not make me into a racist automatically, given that I also complained about Romans being represented by English actors, and I'll get back to that. People who told me, no, you don't like him just because he's African, should keep watching. If by the end of this video they still think that, they probably don't speak English. Now I'm going to ask myself a question, Raf, why don't you like Black like Achilles. Two reasons. Number one, for the same reason I wouldn't like an elf without pointy ears, or a tall dwarf, or a white Gengis Khan. Absolutely ridiculous. They don't fit with how the character is supposed to look. Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson? Equally a big no-no for me. So am I against all actors who portray a character from a foreign country? No. Making all cases equal is also wrong and I'm not going to do that. There are some foreign actors who, if I saw in the middle of the street tomorrow, I would not recognize as foreigners right away. I would if they were from Japan or Africa. That's a fact. On the same note, I think John Wayne as Genghis Khan is absolutely moronic. But Craig Parker as a Roman is fine, because he looks very similar to an Italian, even though he's from New Zealand. I have no problems with him there. Saying that I have to complain about him anyways and saying that he's just as different to your everyday Italian than an African from Congo is just not true and it's not fair and I stand for the truth. If you want to have black actors playing roles of main characters in TV series do what they did at Marvel and set them for instance in Harlem. Heck. Cotton Mouse is one of the coolest guys I've ever seen on screen, or better. If this really was, as they basically put it, a way to be fair and stop having protagonists played only by white guys, then make a whole series taking place in Africa. Tell us the rich African history. Tell us about the Zulu, their leaders, their heroes, their gods. I would binge watch that. The founding story of the Mali Empire, for instance, with a realm divided into 16 provinces with presiding lords in a sort of pseudo-Byzantine thema-type hierarchy. Now, is that something we are ever going to see? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know if that would sell. And of course, these productions need to sell. I understand that. So they choose the War of Troy. Here's the thing. If they really cared about showing real cool warriors as African, black African warriors, then why didn't they talk about Memnon, for example, or some of the actual Ethiopian black warriors who are part of the story but everybody ignores? And just to say, this Memnon is said to be as strong of a warrior as Achilles is, so equal cool, but no, you gotta take Achilles because he's the cool guy, he's the one the cool kids like, and you gotta blackwash him because it's more edgy and it's what you do now. You just take famous characters and blackwash them. And just just before I get um, misunderstood, I'm against whitewashing too. But who cares about what Homer said, right? When he describes him, Achilles, as being very young looking even for his age, with long blonde hair and armored so well that not many parts of his body were actually visible. So both of these are actually not good representations of Achilles, but this one is further away and it's getting to that point because of all the wrong reasons, and this is what I'm attacking. 
Now in this case I believe the problem is rather blatant. It lies in Westminster, London, the headquarters of the British Broadcasting Corporation, aka BBC. The problem I have here is the over-excessive political correctness that we see in BBC latest productions. Well, this has come to the point that if you have in one scene of a film you've got a white guy then you also have to put a black guy and you also have to put an Asian guy. This is why I think that they are doing it for all the wrong reasons and, it has, and you can see that because it has become an obsession and it has become a must. If you don't do it you're homophobic, you're misogynist, you're racist. And this generates situations such as this one in Troy. You gotta have black Achilles, you gotta have black Zeus. But that is the realm of political correctness. You can't say anything about anything. Racism is an awful thing, it's wrong and it should be fought. But it is also wrong to label things that are not racist or opinions that are not racist as racist. Talking about misusing labels and terminology such as racist, misogynistic, homophobic, when it's not the case, it's just an easy way to dignify your opinion, taking advantage of people's basic survival concept of group protection. In other words, we humans have evolved and survived because we stick together and natural selection demonstrated that lone wolves don't make it. So as a result, we perceive as evil and bad anything that prevents the survival of the pack. On the same note, we perceive as good and right things that are beneficial to the group, that pack being a family, a village, a nation, or eventually, hopefully, a planet. The moment these people call someone a racist, you already automatically create an aura of negativity that will be subconsciously felt by other members of the group. So for example, calling me a misogynist when I was just stating biological facts on sexual diamorphism, the physical difference between men and women, is actually pretty bad. Luckily, intelligent people will bypass appearances and see it for themselves that they are in the presence of a misuse of the term. That is the reason why I personally very much resent it when people resort to quick labelling basing it on you don't agree with me. Disliking black Achilles does not make me a racist. Stating on average women are physically weaker than men does not make me a misogynist. Stating a gay scene in a movie was out of place for that specific movie or storyline does not automatically make me a homophobic. A similar situation happened with the BBC cartoon The Story of Life. There has been a huge debate on Twitter, scholars versus people, university professor got insulted, they called them misogynist, blah blah blah. Cutting a long story short, let's read the article together from The Telegraphs. If you have been on a social media at all for the last couple of weeks, you are likely aware of what may be one of the silliest controversies ever. I'd really like to respond to that. Um, it's not silly just because you, the journalist writing this, don't agree with what the opposition says. And it's not right that a true journalist does not belittle the opinion of those who don't agree with him just to win the reader's favour. I already know where this is going, but let's continue. Whether a dark-skinned man should be present in a BBC cartoon for children about life in Roman Britain. Okay, let's start clearing up this, because I think it's rather ridiculous. Um, that's not, that was not the point, that was not what people or the majority of people were arguing against. So this man now, the writer of this, of this article, is playing it very defensively. Ah, they don't want dark-skinned man in a cartoon for children. That's not the problem. At least I don't have any problem with that. The problem is that this is representing Roman Britain. The problem is that on this cartoon you don't have one dark-skinned man as a Roman centurion, which would not have been a typical sight, for sure, but could have happened. The problem with this cartoon is that you have in almost every shot a black guy. Just like I said before, it's an obsession, juxtaposing white and black, white and black, all the time. Black Roman officer, and he's a good guy. Black Roman soldier, he's also a good guy. Black kid, served by white slaves. The only white officer is the Legatus, who is clearly evil. The problem I have is that I see it as an obsession. They are blackwashing history, no doubt about it. Again, mark my words, it surely did happen and it could have happened that you had a black Roman soldier as the Roman Empire was indeed multi-ethnic, multicultural. We can't say to what extent, of course, as that would vary depending on where you look in the empire, but keep in mind that Northern African population does not have the hue of black that we see in this cartoon. That's more of a central sub-Saharan African hue. So what this is doing, the message this cartoon is teaching is in Roman Britain, there were black Central African people all over the place, 
It was normal to have mixed families with Central African black officers all over the place. Slaves were white, which to me is an insult to what so many black slaves had to endure, actually. Not saying that it didn't happen, but I'm just saying now you can't show a black slave because it's so insulting. No, it's the truth and it should be said because it was a terrible thing and it should not be hidden. But of course, the reply that they give you is, if you don't like it, you're a white supremacist, misogynist, racist scum. And of course, a lot of people are going to tell me that, regardless of the fact that I actually have a lot of African friends, I'm interested in African history, and I actually like African people, but that does not matter, because I'm not complying 100% to what now is considered to be cool and edgy. But how about just telling the truth, the true historical facts? Now, as a school teacher and an educator, as that has been my job, my profession, for the last decade, to be honest, I had nothing against teaching social acceptance, against teaching anti-racist ideologies and integration to the kids, as that is a way, a very effective way, to actually prevent violence, both um, physical and psychological abuse, bullying and whatnot, so I'm all in for that. But I fear that now this is going too far. So let me give you a figurative idea. Let's say that we've got, what we've got here is the pendulum, okay? We've got the truth in the middle. But what's going on now is that this overcorrection of the public media swings the pendulum right past the truth and we are ending up with more false information and misconceptions. And, and since I am very much of an enthusiast in terms of Roman history, then it really drives me nuts, I have to be, I have to say it. And I will show you how, even in these articles where they defend this cartoon, they actually contradict each other and, they, and it shows that they are spreading misconceptions and lies just to fit in a current political agenda. And the funny thing is that they are actually trying to force these modern ideologies um, onto people that lived hundreds of years ago, millennia ago. I'll prove it to you. So, if there is actual wrong information, or in the best case scenario, things are over-exaggerated, then how come a Cambridge professor, namely uh, Professor Mary Beard, actually defends the show? Well, give me five minutes and I'll show you what happened. Now we are reading from The Guardian. When the BBC made a cartoon to educate school children about life in Roman Britain, it was hardly expecting controversy, of course, because you see, BBC was trying to follow the current, uh, to fit in with the current uh, trend. So they, were, they thought that they could do basically whatever they wanted as long as they placed, you know, the characters that they thought people want to see now. But no, BBC, people actually like history and people like their literature and their legends. All girls in the cartoon want to fight, are strong, smart, intelligent and interested in combat. All guys are clumsy, not particularly smart, cowards and they do not want to fight. Again, you see the pattern that they are trying to build here? But the inclusion of a high-ranking black soldier in the depiction of a typical Roman family has caused an almighty fallout with historian Mary Beard facing a barrage of abuse for arguing that it was historically correct. And yet, as Professor Beard has pointed out, of course it is perfectly possible even pretty likely that such family existed in Roman Britain and an entirely reasonable thing for the BBC cartoon to have posited. I agree, but madam, please check out the cartoon. It's not one high-ranking black soldier, it's every other frame. You just ha it's a pattern, just like with Black Achilles, just like with Black Zeus. It's the pattern that get people mad, not the single plausible instance. Again, they write, the Roman Empire encompassed large tracts of North Africa, and even though it did not extend to Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's a Sub-Saharan hue of skin, by the way, which I actually like before someone calls me a racist, I'm just pointing the fact. Again, we read, as the empire grew, citizenship was extended across conquered territories. Romans could be from anywhere, from Carlisle to Cairo and beyond, which again fortifies a high percentage of Caucasian white. Romans, with an unknown but surely minor percentage of black Romans, just as a matter of deductive logic applied to geography. In Britain there is plenty of evidence of the presence of soldiers, traders and administrators from all parts of this enormous empire, including from Africa. This is very important now. What is more difficult to do is to say with certainty whether such and such a person was black or white in our terms. These were not categories of interest to the Romans. Keep this statement in mind, you'll see why later. And in the case of elite families from North Africa, say, it's also unclear whether they were original Italian settlers. I'll read this again. And in the case of elite families from North Africa, say, it's also unclear whether they were originally Italian settlers. Point in case. Again, a point in favour of this not being a typical Roman family. 
Now, do you remember the statement that I told you to keep in mind? Very important, let me read it again. When talking about black and white, they say, these were not categories of interest to the Romans. Now, on the Roman perception of black African, still they say, Dr. Nichols notes, the internet discussion was particularly prompted by the appearance of a black Roman soldier in the detachment building Hadrian's Wall. But in fact, there is an ancient account of precisely this. The emperor, Septimus Severus, was inspecting his troops on the wall when one of the garrison's well-known jokers, an Ethiopian, offered him a garland. Severus was startled by the apparent omen, associating the soldier's black colour as a portent of his own imminent death. So let me get this straight. They said that the Romans did not care for skin, and now to prove a point which we have already agreed with, which is the fact that yes, it could be possible to have a black soldier, they're actually proving the other point they made wrong. So much for not caring for skin. This guy just said, gosh, this guy's skin is black. It's a bad omen. I'm gonna die. Now, if that's not racist, I don't know what, what is. So much for skin color. These were not categories of interest for the Roman. Dr. Nichols, with all due respect, I'm sure you're a fantastic academic, but you've just shot yourself in the foot. Now, see what we read here. So, for example, the Emperor Septimus Severus, who came from Libya and was married to a Syrian, Iulia Domna, ran the empire from York. I'd like to say, these are Libyans and these are Syrians. Spot the differences. Again, we read, there was an African governor in Britain, too, in the figure of Claudius Albinus, who came from Tunisia. These are Tunisians. Continuing, Beard suggests that the image in the BBC cartoon was loosely based on another historical figure, the Algerian Quintus Lolicus Urbicus. I don't know how many times I have to do this, but these are Algerians. Because rewriting history doesn't only apply to adding completely erroneous facts, like adding a medieval knight in Roman Britain, but it also includes the concept of exaggerating real facts, like the multicultural Roman province of Britannia, into a place where black people are everywhere, white guys are evil, girls are all strong warriors, and all the things modern 2018 men like to see. That's the overswing of the pendulum. Also, do I have to say anything about the combat scenes on this film? Thank you for watching Nova Once and stay true.